Hello and welcome to the Empathy Podcast. This podcast seeks to explore the minds of those who not only understand or experience empathy, but of those who wish to take action, build, and practice empathetic behavior through conscious decision and responsible lifestyle choices. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, this podcast might be just for you. So sit back, relax, and use what you were born with, empathy. Hello and welcome to the Empathy Podcast. We're delighted to have a super special guest here, um, a big time activist that I'm one of my hugest fans that I have um, as far as activism. And I'm so excited for you guys to get a chance to see her if you haven't already um, and hear her story. So her name is Cassie King and she's an animal liberation activist and a grassroots organizer at Direct Action Everywhere. And she's also hard at work on the campaign trail for Wayne Chung for mayor of Berkeley in 2020. So hopefully we had a chance to talk about that as well. Um, Before we jump right into everything uh, and get this podcast started, I have a few quick questions for you to get us started. My first question I have for you is, what does empathy mean to you? That's a great question. I think of empathy in relation to sympathy because, you know, sympathy is just feeling sad when someone's going through something or sort of being impacted by somebody else's emotions or someone else's experiences. And empathy, I always think of as a a step farther in that you not just feel something for them, but you feel what they're going through. And that's not always easy to do. But I think trying to do that, trying to put ourselves in other people's shoes and imagine or go through what that experience might be like for them is a really important part of activism. And and even for non-activists, just an important part of life to be able to imagine what other people are going through. Yeah. Do you think that some people struggle when it comes to relating empathy to animals? Definitely. I mean, I just said putting yourself in other people's shoes and probably to a lot of people that sounds like other humans. And that's not what I meant. But I know that a lot of people think of people as synonymous with humans still. So uh, definitely. But I, I think anyone who whether they wear shoes actually or not, who has experiences is someone that we could try to imagine what their experiences are like. So wow. imagining experiences of animals for sure. A hundred percent. And do you think that a lot of people are born with it already and maybe it gets lost along the way and maybe they have to um, figure out how to how to tap back into it kind of thing? I don't know. It's something I'd be really curious to see science behind and tests to actually try to analyze empathy levels. I don't know what that would really look like exactly. But yeah, I know that there's an ongoing question, I guess, philosophical question about where empathy comes from if it's something innate and something everyone can have if we just give them the right education or if you know they have the right life experiences to activate their empathy or something or if some people are just more predisposed to be empathetic and we definitely associate empathy with emotion because you're feeling someone else's emotion and we do have a sense that some people are more emotional than other people sometimes with a negative connotation but maybe in in the case of empathy with a really positive one. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. All right. So my next question for you is, why do you think nonviolent direct action is so effective? Well, this is somewhere we actually do have a lot of evidence. We have an increasing amount of social science studying social movements throughout history, uh, including recent ones like Black Lives Matter and Occupy Wall Street and just looking at what actually worked in successful mass mobilizations and in successful legislative campaigns and what didn't. And resoundingly, something that has been successful is taking nonviolent direct action in a sustained way, which means not just one time, not just a one-off camp out or a one-off march, but something that is drawing from a sustained community. So I think it's incredibly effective to build community with the goal of mobilizing hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in a sustained way to put pressure on the system and to create change. And and that's what we have seen historically. What are some of the successes that maybe you've seen in your time uh, with with uh, with your organization? Well, a huge success that Direct Action Everywhere and other coalitional groups had was the California Fur Ban. That's something that obviously has been worked on by many people for decades just to expose the cruelty of fur, to protest fur, to get that message out there. And it worked over time. People started to see fur as a luxury product, as a cruel uh, thing to do to animals, to steal their skin, just to wear it. Um, 
And and once that got out there more, we were able to to continue that pressure to create real systemic change at the legislative level. And California just last year became the first state in the whole country to ban the sale of fur. So a, a whole class of animal products that's now banned and makes you think what other classes of animal products will we soon associate with cruelty and and soon be done with? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's uh, it's exciting to see what what that will be, what the next thing will be and and, and how we how we continue to to march forward um, for this goal of animal liberation, for sure. So the next thing, the next question I have for you is what do you think is the scariest thing or maybe the biggest fear that maybe you had inside of you um, that you personally did for animals in your journey? I've done a lot of pretty scary things for animals. Speaking of doing scary things, especially for the animals, that brings me up today's sponsor of today's podcast. If you, some of you guys don't know, but one of the scariest things that I've been through was suffering from an autoimmune disease and nearly dying. I don't know if you know, but I was fat, sick, and nearly dead. The doctor said I couldn't work out, I couldn't go to work, I lost my fiance, and I definitely couldn't help the animals because I was not in the best health. I needed to help myself. And that's when today's sponsor, the podcast, helped me increase my health, helped me look, feel, and perform my best. And I've been able to help so many more people, so many more animals, and be able to give that to other people. I remember going to activist events, just like Cassie's explaining, just going to rescue animals, going to protest, going to do every single thing that you could imagine. And I see activists struggling to keep up, unable to maintain, losing their health, not being physically capable, running out of breath, having headaches, having these issues, having these challenges that is taking them away from helping the animals. I've even seen worse where people are suffering with diabetes, cancer, and multiple sclerosis, other autoimmune diseases that are taking them away from helping the animals. It doesn't have to be this way. That is exactly why it partners with today's Spawncast is so that you can look, feel, and perform your best. Not only so you can help more animals for the activists out there, but also so that you can show thriving, loving, kind, feeling your best, and that is gonna show through to other people and say, hell yeah, I wanna stop eating animals because I wanna look, feel, and perform my best just like you. And if you're gonna eat vegan food, why not eat the best? Why not eat the highest quality? And today's sponsor, you can get $150 off your first order, which is unbelievable. Check the link in the description. I made a special video of the one that I recommend the most where you can get $150 off and can't wait to hear how you love it. And this one is going to change your life and you will be able to feel your best, perform your best, look your best and be able to do more for animals, do more of what you love. On farms or waiting alone in a car in a field to pick up activists doing an investigation and in the middle of the night or almost getting caught, like those kinds of things obviously jumped to my mind first when I think about what scary things I've done for animals, because it is scary to know you might face violence, you might face legal repercussions, you might not get a call from that person who you're supposed to pick up and be waiting in anticipation to know what's happening there. But those things are are scattered. And I think the the more ongoing fear that most of us face when we're we're challenging the status quo or when we're speaking out is just uh it's kind of scary to put yourself out there and to be a leader, to be um, a, a change maker and just to put yourself really out there on the line for something you believe in without being able to control how people react. So for me, it's even doing social media videos. It's a little bit scary to think, how's this video going to be perceived or making a decision in the DXC community in Berkeley, wondering how's the rest of the community going to perceive that? You know, I think we have to do things. We have to keep trying things, but it's scary to know that uh, there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of people watching and how's this going to be perceived. So not everyone, not everyone becomes an activist, not everyone challenges the status quo, but the more that we do it, the more that we normalize that and the more we put ourselves out there as an example, I think we make it easier for everyone else who who's struggling with that to also step up and speak out and be different. How I recently was talking to someone that, that received, you know, some online hate and received some things and they wanted to stop posting. They actually went to the direction where like, you know, I'm just not going to deal with it. You know, how do you feel like for yourself? How do you handle um, when you're afraid or when you are in, in those scared moments? Like, what do you what do you do? Is there something you tell yourself or how do you how do you 
focus um, at the task at hand and not, um, you know, get discombobulated by whatever might be going on around you or whatever you're thinking. Yeah. I mean, my mom looks at my Facebook page and she says, Cassie, I don't know how you can stand it. I see these troll comments and these people saying mean things to you. And I just, I just want to, you know, get back at them. And I laugh because it's really sweet for my mom to say that, but I don't have that inclination usually because I I try to focus on the good impact that things are having. And also just to distinguish between what's actually good critical feedback that I should try to implement in my activism and what is the kind of garbage that you just have to ignore. So, you know, it's getting easier to just ignore a lot of the garbage because I do have good places to seek out feedback and I do have a really supportive team and, you know, you and other people who give me the positive feedback about the work that I'm doing or who tell me that they've been inspired to do some kind of action or to change their their life for animals after um, seeing what I and others in DXC are doing makes it all worth it. But I definitely think, yeah, you have to know what to pay attention to and what to kind of just ignore if you're going to keep putting yourself out there and keep trying new things. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's been one of the increasing questions as, as like my personal growth, as I continue to grow is like, how do I deal with the hate? How do I deal with the hate? You know, um, as, as it comes along. So it's always a question that I'm, I want to give answers for, you know, from different perspectives, because everyone has their own way. Everyone has their own way to do deal with it, you know, and some people need time. Some people need to meditate, some people, whatever. Some people need to do all kinds of different things um, to handle it. Yeah. So great. All right. Perfect. So it was so amazing to get those quick questions, get a chance to get some intro- introduction to you. So give us a, a brief introduction of yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Well, my name's Cassie. I'm from San Diego, but now I live in Berkeley and actually came up to Berkeley to go to college, which was one of the best decisions I could make to go to UC Berkeley because that's where my activism journey really started. Uh, I met other activists. I found myself in a hub of activism. And so basically, as soon as my eyes started opening to what animals are going through in exploitative industries, I had an immediate outlet to get involved, to, to, to put that anger and that emotion into action. So I know I'm really lucky in that way. And I've been organizing with Direct Action Everywhere since 2016, so almost five years now. And it's been an incredible journey. I've grown so much from that experience. I loved going to school. I loved all the reading, all the writing, majoring in English. It was a blast. But I also feel like I learned more outside of the classroom just from the the real life experiences that I've had in the community where people from all ages from all backgrounds have have taught me so much have become my friends and um, just that kind of hands-on experience of working on the press team and you know learning more about current events and about what the press cycle is like and working on social media and all the opportunities that I was given to to become a leader in DXC to do public speaking all of that stuff, it it really helped me develop as a person. And now I'm actually on DXC's elected leadership team. So if you don't know, we we have democratic elections every two years. And I was elected to our five-person core leadership team, which is an honor and very flattering. And now, you know, I try to do the best job I can making decisions for our chapter and making uh, good strategic decisions that guide us in the right direction, while also working on all these other things that I'm working on and and making lots of funny social media videos and continuing to try to read and write and all that stuff, but hard to find the time. Yeah, actually, it's interesting. The social media, I think, is where maybe a lot of people see you for sure. Um, and they get a chance to experience um, your charm and and your funniness and but also I think creativity, but um, as well. But there's another there's another level that I think a lot of people appreciate, and that's the education um that that is provided like even just like let's say like the pearls video um that you made for example like the amount of learning that people had on just the pearl industry in general just from that one uh short video is just mind-blowing you know i don't think that there there's so many things there that i don't think people very very know very much and i think that that's definitely the biggest thing i'm sure that your 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 mindset is how can i teach people while also making it interesting and engaging you know along the whole way um, and 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 you do an amazing job. I was wondering, do you do you write that out? Do you script it? Um, is it, it's a scripted thing, and then it's like, let's go shoot, or can you tell me a story about like how do you create something like like a video? Like like what 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 would be your most popular one out of those? 
Yeah, definitely. I write the scripts myself and I do a lot of research to be able to make them, which is informative for me, just like it is for the people who watch it. You know, I have a basic understanding of certain things when I choose what to do a product review on, but I also don't know all the details that most of us don't know because they're kept hidden from us. And it's not a fun dinner conversation to talk about oysters being pried open and having irritants shoved inside their soft tissue. You know, people don't talk about that when they think about pearls. So for me, yeah, I do a lot of research. I write the scripts. I try to make them funny, which can be weird when sometimes the videos you're watching are a little disturbing. But I try to make them funny and interesting and satirical so people keep watching. And then I go to a place that actually has those kinds of products and film the video there. And that experience has been pretty interesting. I've been kicked out of Safeway before because they recognized me right when I started. But I've also had employees just sit and, you know, when they were putting cans away or whatever in a shelf, just sort of listen, observe the whole thing. And then at the end say, that was a really good script. (laughs) You know, you never know what you're going to get. People, customers walking by are kind of curious about why I'm saying these things in such a chipper voice about animal cruelty. But it's it's educational for everybody involved, including me. And I think that that's that's super important. The fact that we don't know such basic things that cows are impregnated to produce milk. I didn't know that until someone told me. And then I thought, why didn't I think about that? I don't go around producing milk all the time. Why would a cow? And these basic things that we don't think about, you know, if we can get people to think about them and get them out there, then it makes you realize how much you've been lied to and how much we have to change. Yeah, and I totally agree. Anytime I'm creating something new or talking to someone new, part of what I enjoy is the learning experience. You know, I learned so much from from different people like you or all over the all over the place. And I always say like, I'm just addicted to learning. And I think that it's a lot of fun. Um, so I always enjoy those ones. So the next thing I want to ask you is what um, what led you to to start caring for animals, start having the empathy, start wanting to um, speak up for them. And and because obviously most people um, in, in America, I mean, I'm from San Diego as well. You know, and we know what it's like living there. You know, it's Mexican food everywhere, burritos, fast food, you know, is is rampant. But all of those are are loaded, you know, with 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 animal products and, and a lot of cruelty behind it. So what led you to, to stop participating and paying and funding those industries? I think my progressive journey is similar to other folks in that it took a lot of steps. And the first thing that I did was learn about animal testing and was horrified about that because I'm actually pretty terrified of needles and scared of hospitals and don't want to have my blood drawn even for very valid reasons to help my health. So imagining animals in a situation where people don't care about their health, they don't care about their well-being, and they're poking and prodding them and trapping them in cages and literally operating on them and doing some of these things I find really scary without any care for those animals. It just sounds like a torture chamber to me and kept me up at night after I learned about it. I decided I'm not buying anything else tested on animals and had to find you know, new companies for all the things I was makeup and just household items and stuff. And that was in high school. So I looked online for resources about that and actually wound up on PETA's page with their really resourceful information about um, what products to buy and all that information. And also read their mission statement. And it's kind of funny now because I remember at that point reading that mission statement and agreeing with most of it, but getting to the, you know, animals are not ours to to test on or to wear or to eat and thinking, well, you know, that one's a little bit different, right? Like there's a reason that we eat animals and we can't just sacrifice our health or, you know, not eat food. Uh, I don't know. I that I wish I'd thought more about it in that moment. I can remember that moment just uh, <laughs> not thinking enough about it, but sort of glossing over it and justifying it in my mind, the cognitive dissonance, and not recognizing that that's what it was. But I, I remember it in hindsight as that. But eventually, I, I actually went vegetarian a couple years later in my senior year of high school because of something kind of bizarre, which is Proposition 2 that was passed in California to basically increase the the welfare of animals and farms to expand the minimum size of cages and uh, things like that. 
it finally went into effect years after it was passed in January of 2015, which is when my dad told me because he knew I loved animals and he he knew I'd thrown out things, tested on animals and all of that. Cassie, great news. And I was so excited, you know, what? And he says, California just made it a new law where chickens have to be able to fully extend their wings inside their cages. They have to, as a minimum, have enough space in their cages to fully extend their wings. So, you know, imagine for a human for us to be able to stick out our arms all the way. And now we're able to do that inside the cage that we still live in. And it was just a surreal moment. I just felt so confused. I felt so confused that that could be called good news. And I didn't understand why they couldn't do that before, that there were chickens in California, this progressive state, you know, my home state where they couldn't even go like this with their wings all the way out. And I stopped trusting that we were buying animals that were treated well, if that could happen and if I could not know about it. So I decided right then I was not eating animals anymore. And my dad didn't see that one coming. But, you know, that's 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 the good thing about legislation like that, even though it really doesn't achieve enough for animals. And I think in some cases it signals to people that we should keep eating animals because now the problem solved. Oh, now, you know, animals live a good life in these farms. So it's okay. We don't have to worry about animal abuse anymore. It's been dealt with, which we know is not the case. And these, these propositions and regulations are not enforced, which I know from investigations, but it does get the issue out there into conversation. It gets people to talk about it and gets my dad to tell me, what's going on and read about it in the news and and for some people like me to decide that this is not okay and to see it for what it is so that's what led me to go vegetarian and like I said when I came up to college at UC Berkeley everything quickly spiraled from there yeah so I think that you say that it is a similar journey as far as people you know like kind of like a path like a like a I learned this and then I learned this and I learned this and you're right from that like that is very common but I think your situation is very unique. I don't think very many people would look at that situation like a prop two and think in the way that you thought. I think that, that most people would think that's a good thing, you know, and now I feel better about my choices. Not like, wait, now I feel a little bit worse about my choices. I even posted one thing yesterday, you know, with a picture of me and a cow and the cow was, um, it was in Bali, Indonesia. And it was, I was driving down the road and I saw some cows on the side of the road and I said, I'll stop. But they were tied up with a rope through their nose. But when the picture I took, it looked like a very nice picture. And if you didn't read the caption, you might have thought it was a nice, a nice picture of a nice, happy cow. But the truth is, like, as you know, you know, that that that's kind of like a facade. It's like like it's on the side of the road intentionally. Like this is this is the nice part, you know, and and the, the truth is that like the sad part is that that even though that looks nice. Right. And it looks nice that the, the animals are happy or they they can extend their wings and that that looks nice on on paper, even the visual like the cow looked nice, you know, looked like maybe they were OK or happy or even driving down California. Right. When we see some of the cows like it doesn't look so bad. Right. Um, and so it is an intentional, you know, placement on let's put these 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 um, animals in, in kind of plain sight or that you can see that it looks nice and then uh, behind closed so doors. What's not in plain sight is the slaughterhouse that those dairy cows are all going to end up at just like the quote beef cows. We don't know where the slaughterhouses are. They're not in plain sight. Yeah, exactly. So then after that, so you, you learn more about the vegetarian, right? Because that's, that's um, part of the animal. So, so how did you lead towards, uh, when did you learn more about the eggs and the dairy and, and, and uh, about the, that information? Yeah, I came up to UC Berkeley and because I was vegetarian, I was searching for another roommate. Uh, just on a Facebook, you know, roommate search to try to find someone who had similar values or bed times or whatever as you. And I found someone who, among other things that she said, had put that she was vegetarian. And I thought, oh, that's great. Like, I don't want to be around someone eating animals. So I ended up rooming with that person. And basically, she just told me, I, I'm going to go vegan now that I'm moving out of my parents' house and controlling all my own food, which is a great time. I know a lot of people struggle with that change when they're still living at home with parents or, or anyone who's not supportive. And I just genuinely didn't know why. And she told me and she showed me the dairy is scary video that's so famous online. And she told me about the egg industry and I got it. 
because I already was halfway there. I just hadn't really learned. And so I think it is really important for people to learn those basic things because not for everyone, but for some people, that's enough. They're going to hear that and say, I had no idea that this was animal abuse. I don't want to support those industries anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Like I always say, like, I think 99% of people won't, wouldn't really harm an animal um, if, if the animals in front of them or had the opportunity. So when they realize that like their, their actions are, are causing this harm, you know, you're right. Most of them, once they realize that, or like you say, some of them, once they realize that they're like, you know, I don't, I don't want to do that. I definitely, the least I could do is definitely not harm someone or harm. Yeah. Harm anyone else. Yeah. So then after that, so what led you to, to, uh, become active and, and what inspired you to become more active? Like what point were you like, because for me, I felt like I got to a point where I said, I got to do something like like it wasn't enough just to just to not participate. I said, I need to help others, you know, learn what I've learned, because if they learned what I've learned, then maybe they would think that a similar way or maybe make some similar actions um, because of the changes that we need in, in this world. Big time. I totally had that feeling as soon as I realized what was going on for the production of dairy and eggs and thought, how did I not know this? My first thought was, well, other people just don't know. Okay, we've got to get this message out there to other people because they're also just living in ignorance. And once we let them know, they're going to change too, which not always, like I just said. And so I'm not, uh, my, my goal with my activism today is definitely not just trying to convert people in their diet at all. It's trying to create systemic change because we don't need everyone to change. We need a small fraction of the population to take action. But I'm just lucky that I happened to be in a, in a place where there was an activist community. I actually got involved first with the UC Berkeley Animal Rights Club on campus, which is called Berkeley Organization for Animal Advocacy. And there was some overlap in membership with the people in that group who also were active with DXC in the Bay Area. So, you know, I started going there and doing some speak outs against animal testing at UC Berkeley and just basic protests and bake sales and all that stuff with other Cal students. And then I learned from them about this bigger network of activists that, that was actually founded in the Bay Area and that had weekly community gatherings at, at one of the houses and was invited to go to that. And so I did. Uh, just honestly, I see it as I got very lucky because people helped educate me, which I'm incredibly grateful for. I think it is a gift. And when we're doing outreach, we have to see it that way, that we're, we're not just delivering bad news, although it is sad to tell people about the suffering that's happening. It's really a gift to give people knowledge that that they've been without. And then I was lucky enough to be in an area where there was an activist community and people gave me the opportunity to speak on the megaphone and, you know, to, to just learn from other people and their activist experiences and to quickly become someone who identified as an activist because not everybody does, but I did. I was like, great. I want to take action. Yeah, absolutely. That's so great. So um, now with um, within the organization that you're in, what are some of the things, some of the actions that you guys are doing, some of the things that you guys are taking to, to make a difference? So we're still very focused on building community and those Saturday community gatherings that I just mentioned still happen. But right now they're happening on Zoom, <laughs> trying to adapt to the whole situation. But Obviously, right now, almost more than ever, community and support is really important. There's a lot of people who are at home, isolated, working from home, just not getting out or not getting um, support in, in their lives outside of the community. And so we're trying to make sure that people know there's still a community here. One of the cool things that's happened with those is now that they are online, we've actually had more of our international community members join as well. Um, DXCs all around the world. And so people in Japan and Mexico have also joined those Saturday morning meetups and it's been it's been fun to be able to sort of share news updates from around the world and and just get together with a broader group of people. But once we built that base of people, our, our theory of change is that we need to take sustained nonviolent direct action, which means there's a lot to that. Sustained is like it's going to be a long journey. <laughs> so we want the people in our community to stick around and not burn out and not, you know, move somewhere else and get a different job and forget about activism, which is hard because the the retention rate just among vegans is already pretty low, let alone among activism, which is a, a tiring and, and sometimes unrewarding job to work to work on 
um, when you have to be confronted with so much suffering. And so that's that's one of the major reasons the community support is so important and and being there for each other and celebrating our victories along the way, all that stuff so that it's not so overwhelming. But yeah. continuing, yeah. go ahead. No, I think those are those are amazing points. And those are some of the things that I definitely talk about and share with people that are are having some of those challenges that you that you do speak of the burnout, you know, uh, the wanting to quit, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I almost find a lot of my my time spent is is like almost like therapy sessions, like, you know what I mean? Like sometimes, you know, Um, and yeah, yeah. And that's great. So what do you what would you say is um, the reason that you think social media has such a big impact or what are some of the positive um, effects that you've seen through using social media? And, and activism, just so you know, I'm a huge advocate, as you know, an ad- advocate for the social media as well, uh, because I'm always pushing people to do more um, in that field, um, because some are just sitting at home, like you said, we're here, we're sitting at home, we don't, um, maybe some aren't going anywhere, whatever they're doing, um, but definitely a lot of people have more time on their hands. And the people that care about animals and the people that are activists already, sometimes they're looking on what can I do? Um, so what would you say is some of the things that you've learned um, from your growth on social media and the impact you had and maybe some advice that you'd give to people that are are thinking about doing it. Sure. Well, it's got its pros and its cons for sure. I'm aware that social media addiction is real, that social media can isolate people. But the, the fact of the matter is right now we have this technology at our fingertips that we've never had before. And just like other social movements around the world, Arab Spring, for example, taking off on Twitter, you know, we just see that this is a tool that can instantly bring in millions of people to a a movement. So we've got to use it. And I think we have to try to use it in a way that, that shares our values and that makes, um, you know, puts positive messaging out there more than, than the kind of negative messaging that sometimes social media devolves into. So definitely in terms of um, the ability to reach more people than you can in person, that's the, the first reason that social media is so impactful. Having millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people watch a video is more than any audience I've ever spoken to in person. I think the most people I've addressed in person is a thousand at one of our marches, giving them the briefing for the march, which is a lot, but nothing compared to 5 million people who viewed one of our videos on Facebook. So just instantly able to reach more people and people who are, are around the world in different places. Um, we, we've told a story of one of our community members, Sanjeev, who's from India and who used to worship animals in temples and then realized through his activist journey that those animals weren't really being worshipped. And, and his video is blowing up in India. There's people in India right now who we have no contact with in Berkeley except for on social media where they're really talking about this. They're seeing someone who is sharing their culture and their background talking to them about the animal rights movement today and how he rescues animals from farms. And that kind of connection is beautiful. The fact that that can happen in this way so immediately is really inspiring to me. So I think we we have an incredible tool and we can reach people we wouldn't otherwise, but we also have to be really mindful of the, the toxicity in social media too. And so at least in our in our commenting, in our engaging with people, in the, the posts that we make, we try to practice being... Uh, just kind and humble and assuming good faith and not gossiping and not jumping to conclusions and going off into a social media battle because that can happen too and escalate very quickly when you can't see people face to face. So that that's a problem right now because we're not seeing each other face to face and it is harder to navigate relationships and everything in the social media era. Yeah. So what advice would you give to maybe some activists that they want, they do want to get on it and they want to share their message? Um, what might, what advice might you give to them? I would definitely tell you to do it. I would just say to, to act like you are in person and, you know, not use social media as a, a curtain to hide behind, to be a, a person that you wouldn't be proud of in person. You know what? That's a really good point. I don't think I've heard anyone say that. <laughs> um, I really like that point. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, cool. That's great. So is there anything else that maybe you want to share um, that we haven't talked about already or maybe a really big thing that you want to leave everyone with? Well, I hope that you will find the kind of activism that works for you. There's so much going on in the animal rights movement. Even in DXC, we have so many different pieces and people support our movement in so many ways. 
the social media is one thing that the, the vigils like that we just did at Farmer John when I saw you there, Kevin, had so much going into it. So, so many roles. The online aspects are a great way to get involved, even if you're staying at home or even if you live farther away. That's an avenue where you can be incredibly helpful in, you know, being a social media influencer and promoting posts or doing research or writing things that that go up on online for people to read on media more. Um, there's so many ways to help. So I just, I want people to hear my story and think I can find my own thing that works for me too. And maybe it's not what I am doing, but there's something for you that you can do for animals, I'm sure. So find it and do it. That's the big thing. Is there any message that you want to leave for um, about Wayne for the mayor in 2020? Well, if you're in Berkeley, by all means, vote for him, please. And if you're not, you can donate. Um, he's doing public financing, which is really setting him apart from the incumbent mayor. He's basically limited to only receive $50 maximum from any donor. So, you know, even if he wanted to, he couldn't take PAC money like the current mayor is doing. He couldn't be bought out by bigger corporate interests. But um, what that means is if he can only get $50, he needs more people to donate. And uh, Berkeley also has a great public financing where they option where they match donations from within Berkeley. So that's really helpful. But whether you're in Berkeley or not, you can go to wayneformayor.com. You can donate. Uh, you can sign up to do phone banking or texting. It is getting down to the wire. So look it up right now. Do it in the next couple of weeks before November 3rd, but also post November 3rd, just Stay tuned and hopefully we'll have good news to share and a lot more ways for people to support what's going on in Berkeley. All right. That's great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and uh, thank you so much for sharing. I can't wait for everyone to get a chance to see this and uh, I'll be letting you know as soon as it's all ready. Thanks so much. Thank you guys for listening to the podcast. Please, please, please make sure that you guys share this with anyone that you think will find this interesting and also make sure that you guys subscribe because I can see a lot of you guys are listening but you aren't subscribed. 